This is Dr. Dev again, your cataract coach. We have a case today of a brunescent cataract. We're using a diamond keratome here to make a temporal phaco incision. Single plane of an appropriate tunnel length that looks very nice. There's very little red reflex, so we're going to adjust our microscope. Those two lights you see on the central cornea are the coaxial lighting with the oculars, and that gives us a better red reflex. Even then, it's still not a great view. We could certainly use tripan blue dye in this case, but I think we'll be able to make a beautiful capsorexis just with this illumination alone. So when we look at this, there's the rexis. We don't want a small rexis. Very important in a brunescent lens to have a sufficiently large capsorexis, at least five millimeters. And again, we're using the forceps that are marked off at two and a half and five millimeters from the tip, so we can judge the appropriate size as we're making it. Taking our time here, going reasonably slow to just make sure we're going to get a round, intact capsorexis. And that looks just beautiful. Now for hydrodissection, we're going to intentionally try to get this nucleus out of the bag. Why is that? Well, we know that these brunescent cataracts tend to have that leathery or fibrous posterior plate. So the posterior aspect of the lens nucleus becomes very hardened and, like I again said, leathery. That's probably the best term. It doesn't want to split easily. So here's the entire big nucleus. We're lucky this is a myopic eye, so there's plenty of room. And we've just flipped the nucleus over. So now the posterior aspect of the lens is facing the phaco incision. That's a recoating of the endothelium with our dispersive viscoelastic. At this point, we'll get our phaco probe, and we're using primarily torsional phaco energy. We've got it set to a very high power setting. We can use some phaco power modulations. Use a new phaco tip. Make sure it's nice and sharp. And we'll insert that into the eye. And we also notice that the incision is a little bit leaky. That's good. We need to keep it cool. Buzz the probe in the center. Get the chopper around the equator of the lens. And boom, separate into two big pieces. Buzz again into the central part of this nucleus, this half. Chop around the periphery and try to split it again. And it may keep falling off the tip because of the nature of this cataract. But there we've got a good crack and a good split. So we have one quadrant free here. There it is. Again, phaco power modulations are allowing us to use a minimal amount of energy. You also know that there's good draping here. All the lashes are out of the way. The lid margin is completely isolated. So we're taking our time using this phaco probe and the chopper to just take out the first half. And so that's the first half has been broken up into two quarters and now each quarter is being subdivided further just like that and sometimes the pieces won't separate fully that's okay again they are leathery this is fibrous and there's a hesitancy for these pieces to separate we'll just take our time using the phaco probe getting the pieces one by one and aspirating them down we want to have a high vacuum setting here, so at least 400 millimeters of mercury, depending on the size of your phaco tip. I like a sufficiently large infusion pressure, at least 80, maybe more millimeters of mercury of infusion pressure. If you're using a machine with bottle height, that means a relatively high bottle height, at least 100 centimeters above the patient's eye level. Well, why did I stop? We only have about half the nucleus out. Well, it's time to recoat the corneal endothelium. So more of the dispersive viscoelastic. We're recoating the central endothelium here. That looks great. The flow in this, set, in this case is pretty high, 35 or 40 cc's a minute. And that's going to wash off some of the viscoelastic from the corneal endothelium. So we'll lose that protection. And so that's why we recoat it. In addition, when we put more phaco power in the eye, we need to protect those endothelial cells from that. So again, here's the second half. We're trying to chop it into further small pieces. I think we should be able to get it here. That's great. And even then, it's still fibrous. So taking our time, separating these out. And this is going beautifully. Now you also keep attention to the incision here temporally. It is leaking. We want that. We don't want a tight incision here. This phaco probe is going to get hot, and we need to avoid causing a phaco wound burn. 
Of course, power modulation is one step, but having a sufficiently large incision that will leak a little bit is another step to help cool things down. Plus, we want to float in the incision and not let the phaco probe get pushed against any side or roof or floor of the incision. So we're doing pretty well here. Very little nucleus is left. Taking our time to take this piece down. Now, where's the chopper? Look at the position. Protection. we got to protect the capsular bag. We don't want it to come up. How much epinucleus is there going to be? Almost none. How much cortex? Very little. So after taking down these nuclear pieces, nothing is going to weigh down the capsular bag. So we'll put the chopper in that protective position. I'm going to re-chop it just a little bit more. There we go. And again, we're showing you the video unedited and in real time, just so you can see every little detail. We take out these last few pieces, and again, we're watching very carefully to make sure the capsule bag does not come forward. You can change some of the fluidic settings to make them better in your favor, maybe more infusion pressure, and maybe slow down on the vacuum level or the flow rate. It's all about the balance of the inflow of fluid coming in the eye versus the outflow. Only one source of inflow, that's of course the BSS bottle or the BSS bag. But there are two sources of outflow. What we aspirate down the center of the phaco tip, as well as what leaks from around the incision, both the main incision as well as the paracentesis. So again, we've done a good job here. Essentially, all of the nucleus is out. Maybe a little fragment left here. We'll get that. Very little cortex is left. Certainly no epinucleus. And you see, it's reasonable fluidic settings. There's not much variance or shallowing of the anterior chamber. I have the staff switch over to the irrigation aspiration probe. And in removing the cortex, we're going to watch it very carefully. We want to do it in a circumferential manner. And we just also want to double check to make sure the zonules are normal. So that means looking at the capsular edge. That right there is a reverse pupillary block. And we lift the edge of the iris up to break that. That's why the enter chamber is so deep. You recall I said earlier this patient's highly myopic. So removing the cortex here, looking very carefully to make sure the edge of the capsorex doesn't move. And we want to also confirm that we do have the whole capsorex intact, and we do, and that looks great. So we're again removing all the cortex here. Um, you notice the three lights on the cornea, that one coax, one two coaxial and then one of um, the main lighting. Those are important as well to give us good visualization of everything but keep in mind they can exa they can exaggerate the amount of material that's left so if you see little tiny flecks of things i wouldn't worry at this point we're going to fill the caps or bag up here with our cohesive viscoelastic um the black ink marks on the cornea or at the limbus are at the four cardinal positions, 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. And those little dots on the cornea are dots I made early on showing me where I should orient my torque lens. So we're going to implant our lens here to single piece monofocal torque lens. It's going to go in the caps or bag and we'll certainly line this up. Everything looks beautiful here. We'll have a nice overlap of the rexus. And we're going to start to rotate the lens. We'll leave it just a, a one or two clock hours shy of its final position. And we're going to go underneath the IOL and remove the viscoelastic. So those are the marks on the cornea. Can we see those? So here comes the eye probe. Wash the surface of the eye. We need to get this here. We'll fix the reverse pupillary block so the anterior chamber is not overly deep. And we do need to get underneath this optic to remove that uh, viscoelastic. So there we go. We can lift up the optic. Not quite. We'll try again. Almost. No, still not quite. There's breaking the reverse pupillary block. That's when the anterior chamber pressure is higher than the posterior chamber. So again, that's fixed. Now we're clearly under the optic. Just making sure the chopper, that the haptic stays in the bag. 
It's removed the viscoelastic from behind the optic, and we're ensuring that the entire lens and both haptics are still securely placed within the capture bag. We're moving more viscoelastic from the anterior chamber, especially the angle. And this is done with a high vacuum and high flow rate. Chopper is going to be placed in the eye, and we're going to use the chopper to dial our lens. Just needs to go about a clock hour. And all we have to do is line up our toric marks on the eye well with those marks that we made on the cornea. Once those are in alignment and we've accounted for the parallax, we know that we have the toric lens exactly where we want it. So that's pretty close. We're going to nudge it over just a tiny bit more. That is absolutely spot on. So now we can pull the chopper out of the eye, pull the probe out. Let's hydrate up these incisions. Watch how I hydrate in the mid stroma, back and forth, back and forth. Avoid going near the decime line. Avoid excessive hydration. You don't need much. You need just enough. And then here's injecting BSS in the anterior chamber. Let's check the lens position. Looks still fantastic. I like that. We'll inject into the angle just to make sure there's no retained viscoelastic there. Seal the incision. We confirm the whole lens is behind the uh, capsorexis, and it is beautifully lined up with our toric marks. Now, certainly there's going to be some inflammation in this eye for post-op day one, so how can we help with that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to put in tramcinolone. So we'll put some preservative-free tramcinolone in the eye. Again, a little more hydration of the incision. Very gentle, don't need much. A little bit more to get the pressure appropriate. That looks great. Seal that up. Normal pressure. And that looks great so far. Here's the triamcinolone. We see these particles. How much is it? It's less than a milligram. Just a little bit of to cause a snow globe effect. That'll be in the anterior chamber for a day or two, but then be rapidly washed out. We can throw that around. And the last step is a little preserve-free moxifloxacin in the anterior chamber, in the stroma, and a drop on the cornea. We'll double check everything. Here's a sponge soaked in tetracaine so the patient can be comfortable in the post-op period. And now we'll finally check. The incisions are watertight and this eye looks great. Normal pressure as well. Patient did beautifully and had a fantastic result and was very pleased. Thanks so much for watching.